I don't think that civil disobedience is the only way to change things, but I think that the history of social movements and transformative projects of that kind shows that it's an important way to change things, that it's an important, probably essential element in the repertoire of social movements that are fighting for changes on a macro level. I mean, you could, I mean, obviously, the obvious examples are uh, the national, Indian National Liberation Movement or the American Civil Rights Movement, but the workers' movement, the women's movement, the gay rights movement, the German anti-nuclear movement, I don't think you can in fact point to a major social movement that has won major transformative gains that didn't at some point and in some parts involve civil disobedience. And the reason for that is quite simply that in any society, the rules that the society gives itself are designed to reproduce the society. If the society is, say, racist, exploitative, sexist, or destructive of the environment, then the rules that society gives itself will, by and large, perpetuate that state of affairs. It will continue to destroy the environment, continue to be sexist, continue to be racist, continue to be exploitative. Therefore, breaking these rules is not just necessary, it's also legitimate. And some people will then say, well, okay, but we live in these democracies and, you know, why do you have to break the rules? You can change them through established political processes. Well, the thing is that civil disobedience also is really important in a very crowded attention economy, like where, you know, there are many, many stories, pointless Kim Kardashian, whatever stories vying for attention. And in fact, civil disobedience is a way to call society's attention to a particular area where folks are saying, actually, you know what, this is a real big problem. Take the German anti-nuclear movement, which said, you know, the big problem with the nuclear industry is that it produces, not just that it produces occasional things that blow up, but also that it constantly produces this nuclear waste when nobody has any idea where to put it. So we're going to start a civil disobedience campaign around or against the trains that keep trying to dump the nuclear waste in some deserted corner of Germany. We're going to say there is a conflict here. This doesn't actually work. You can't actually dump this because people do live here. And as a result, society's attention is focused on the issue, and then the political system starts having to move, having to do something. And that can be seen throughout the history of social movements. So most of your uh, civil disobedience and, and uh, uh, activism work is around climate justice. Um, and you're currently facing a serious refugee crisis mm. uh, in Austria. Is there a connection between climate change and the current refugee crisis that you're facing? So one has to always be a bit careful, like whenever there's a current crisis, everybody kind of tries to attach their policy issue to it. But the data is actually pretty clear. There was a major drought, um, climate change related, that increased grain prices in Syria uh, in 2010 and 2011, which basically meant that price for basic foodstuffs went up. And you can actually see the places where the rebellion started in 2011 were precisely the places that also had massive increases in basic foodstuffs, which were more or less driven by climate change. Now, this is precisely the kind of social justice crisis that climate justice advocates have always said is going to erupt around climate change. Now, obviously, there are many other reasons for the Syrian rebellion and the, 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 the consequent migration um, to Europe and, well, obviously also in the, in, the, in the surrounding countries. But climate change and climate justice are important issues in the current crisis, and this is essentially what we're going to be looking at more and more and more. By the way, just parenthetically, this morning I got up and I opened the FT, and it said that the world's worst hurricane is about to hit Mexico. Like, not just the world's the, the worst hurricane ever in Mexico, but the world's worst hurricane is about to hit Mexico. Like, this is the kind of stuff, like, this means people losing their land, this means internal migratory pressures in Mexico. It, of course, also means more migration towards the US. This is exactly the kind of thing that we're going to be seeing in a world that keeps getting hotter and hotter. And how do people kind of um, take that information and do something with it? I think that it points to the fact that when we in Germany, like, so in Germany right now, which is where I live and work, um, obviously Germany has seemed to be, has, has, be has, has seemed to play a rather positive role in terms of saying, yes, you know, people can come here, we will take in all these uh, refugees, and um, 
I dare say that that was not just a government decision, but that was very much pushed by the fact that ordinary Germans actually went to the train stations and said, hey, you know what, folks, you guys are welcome here. And as, well, as, as, as everybody knows, Angela Merkel doesn't tend to move before the chips have fallen a certain way. So this was not a government thing. It was actually folks on the ground saying, you know what, we, we understand why people are coming here. Um, people doing civil disobedience without maybe even knowing that's what they were doing. That is in fact the way civil disobedience often works. You kind of say, you just you start breaking rules. It doesn't necessarily involve a massive clash with the police. Like another example, sort of I'll get back to the refugee question in a moment, but um, there are also like laws that, like take for example the marijuana being criminalized. Like basically the fact that people just get stoned wherever they want more or less in large parts of Germany or Austria means that the law is effectively defunct. Like that's just an everyday bit of disobedience. We've just said, that's a crap law. There are still many laws, many countries in which sodomy, as in gay sex, is actually illegal. Except that we don't really let ourselves be stopped by that. So that law, we have made it defunct. We have made an unjust law not work by just continuously disobeying it. And that way we in fact drive political change from below. Another important aspect about disobedience is to remember that it was the disobedient marches of the Syrian and other refugees that basically brought down the Dublin system, which was a essentially fairly idiotic system of organizing migration in the European Union. Um, that system was brought down by the disobedient marches of the, of the refugees, which were organized by Syrian activists who had learned disobedience in the Syrian rebellion of 2011. So you see how all these things are, this sounds like hippie, but these things are, are all connected. Now, in terms of what can be done now, I think there's two elements to the response that people uh, can think about. The first is obviously, let's call it emergency relief, but let's think about it more along the lines of Occupy Sandy um, than expecting necessarily sort of government agencies to pick up the slack. What, when Hurricane Sandy hit New York, um, Obviously lots of people were, were in dire straits, um, people were cut off from supplies, and it turns out that the US state has very, very weak structures for dealing with this kind of, this kind of crisis. And it was many activists who'd gotten politicized in Occupy, in the Occupy movement, that said, you know what, we're gonna go there and set up these, these, um, these support structures ourselves. Um, when Katrina hit New Orleans, it was actually a bunch of anarchists that set up the first functioning medical clinic in a city that got completely abandoned by, by the federal authorities. Now Europe is a bit different, we still have higher expectations of what, what our states and governments can do, but it's also important to realize that um, they will not, like a state that has been crippled by decades of neoliberalism, simply doesn't have the capacity or as it were the desire um, to organize substantive help for a lot of people. And it is important for us on the ground to say, what can we do ourselves? Um, not in order to delegitimize the state intervention and sound like the neoliberals. Clearly the state has to step in and move in, but in terms of creating the lateral connections between us and the folks from Syria, so we don't just see them as some faceless mass of people that are demanding state services, this basic, we provide emergency help, is very important. And then of course there's the other issue. Um, this will almost certainly trigger a massive right-wing backlash. Like the right-wing in Europe is A, terrified of all the refugees moving in, and B, very excited about all of them coming because it escalates social debates exactly around an issue that they tend to win. So this is the second way in which we need to become active. We need to ready ourselves for the right-wing onslaught or backlash that's gonna follow in this. And thirdly, we need, to, we need to understand that currently, in terms of the migration issue, the European Union is being reshaped from below in a way that we haven't seen possibly ever. The European Union is a totally fascinating political construct. It was designed to be insulated against popular pressure from below. I, I don't know if you've ever tried and have a demonstration in Brussels in the EU bubble. It's like the, the one place you do not want to have a big popular demonstration in. It's, it's a bit like the EU is the institutional equivalent of Paris after Baron Haussmann said, oh, we're done with having all these barricades put up everywhere. We're just going to build big boulevards that my cannons can fire straight down. That was, in fact, the way Paris was redesigned after the various struggles of the 18th and 19th century. And then the European Union is the institutional equivalent of that. And suddenly, this movement of refugees comes, smashes down the Dublin Treaty, puts massive pressure on Schengen, 
And that means that movement pressures from below are currently capable of reshaping the European Union in ways that we thought were impossible after the failure of Syriza. And I think that's what we need to be aware of as social movements right now. Certainly we are playing with the big boys. What happens in this migration crisis will determine the way um, freedom of movement is played out or not in the European Union in the near future. And um, so organizing immediate assistance, guarding against the right-wing backlash, and realizing that we're actually, with our actions, now playing at a European-wide policy level that also has global resonance. I think those are like the th th three things we need to think about.